Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. <clears throat> I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we are a webinar, a webcast, uh, online show. Uh, terminology is up for debate. Um, but uh, so you, but yeah, you can call us whatever you want. Whatever you call us, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, the shows are recorded, um, however, so if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website, and um, all of our previous shows, going back to when we first started this in uh, January 2009, are all on our archive pages. Um, so you can go there and see anything um, that you might have missed. Uh, the show and the recordings are all free and open to anyone to watch, so f please do share with your friends, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we've had on the show. Um, as for our topics, we're pretty broad. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, book reviews, uh, demos. Uh, basically, our only criteria is that it is somehow library related, and we are happy to have it on the show. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come in and do sessions sometimes, uh, talking about things that we're doing here locally in Nebraska and at the Commission. Um, but we also do bring in guest speakers from across the country, and as we have this morning. Um, on the line with us is Jennifer Korber. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Je Hi Krista. <laughs> Okay. And she is, I think I have your new title here, a Public Instruction Curriculum Development Coordinator. Yes, and right? it's quite a mouthful. It is, yeah. <laughs> uh, she does cool public instruction stuff at Boston Public Library, let's say that. <laughs> yes, that is um, really accurate. Yeah, and um, I've worked with her before on presentations and, and whatnot, and um, I saw she had written this uh, pretty cool article in Library Journal last month it was came out, I believe. Yep, yeah, June 1st. June, and um, about this, you know, dealing with training your staff and devices and whatnot. And so I decided, I asked her to come on the show and share uh, with us uh, what she's got to tell us about managing this crazy device deluge that we are all dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll just uh, hand over to you. Take it away, Jen. All right, sounds good. Uh, good morning, everybody, and in particular, good morning uh, to Michael Sowers, who I know is out there in the audience. I saw him log in. Um, and he'll become relevant later. Uh, this morning we are talking about managing the device deluge and specifically not so much managing the, the devices we have in our buildings but also the devices that our patrons are coming in with because as you all might have noticed the number of things that people come in asking about looking to do library looking to access library services on looking to use in the course of doing their work at the library, that number and variety of devices has increased exponentially over the last 10 years. And I can say over the last 10 years because, oh, there we go, uh, because in 2006 I attended my first internet librarian because of a trend I'd been noticing in the branch I was working in at the time, which was that Computers, we've been offering computers, public computers, for a long time. People have been bringing in their laptops. But there had started to be a serious uptick in how technology was affecting what I did every day in the branch. And so I heard about Internet Librarian and attended it in the fall of 2006. And when I came back, I was asked to write up a little report to put out to the rest of the staff at the library. And you can read it on the screen, but basically librarianship had shifted fundamentally. Not changed, because the core of what we did hadn't really changed. We still provided information services, we still offered learning resources, and we found recreational reading and activities. But there was beginning to be a shift in how we had provided those services, and particularly the devices that we had provided them on and that I thought very strongly at the time, and still do, that the key isn't resources, but attitude. How we as staff got out there and dealt with all of this stuff that was coming into our buildings, and being able to adapt, change, and keep up. And that has really been the core of everything that I have done for most of the past 10 years with regards to working with staff, working with the public, working on presentations and training, my own development, 
all of that has been about figuring out ways to just keep up and keep on top of it and be able to handle it and help when people come into our buildings looking for looking for information about these things in their lives. And I gotta say, when I said this in 2006, it scared people because, as it says, librarianship hadn't really changed. We'd been using, in the buildings particularly, we'd been using roughly the same stuff for decades. The ILSs had changed, yes, we'd added catalog computers, but fundamentally what we did to use what we used to use our to do our jobs hadn't changed very much and now it was and this is 2006 is before the iPhone it's before the iPad it's before Twitter it's before Facebook it's before all of these things that are now commonplace and so we've been asked to do a lot in 10 years and we're going to be asked to do even more moving forward because the problem is that the number of devices, the sorts of technology that exist in people's everyday lives, it's just getting broader, it's getting deeper, it's getting more widely varied. It's, there's just more of it. Um, you've got everything from iPads and Kindles and iPhones and Android devices of all sorts, laptops, all this more now what we call more standard stuff, to the things that people are bringing into their homes and Chromecasts and Rokus and smart everything in your house, from smart watches on your body, to smart thermostats on your wall, to smart onesies keeping track of your loved ones as they sleep. Um, there's another one out there called the Mother, which is this kind of monitoring system for anybody, not just babies, but people of any age, and it kind of keeps track of them, and they can check in with you, and you check in with it. Kind of somewhere between freaky and wonderful, all at the same time. And no, these are not obviously the Chromecast, the baby onesie, are not things that our patrons are bringing in with them or using for library services, but they are absolutely things that people are asking reference questions about or looking for help in learning how to use or just trying to, to deal with the things in their lives. And by helping people, our patrons, dealing with the things in their lives, we also have to learn how to deal with it in ours, um, both as staff and just as members of this technology using public. So this is the problem, is that it's just getting, I won't say worse, because I don't think it's worse. I think it's just more diverse and more complicated. Now, complicated problems can require complicated solutions, but sometimes they can kind of also be fairly simple ones. And the training ideas that I put forth in the Library Journal article and in other presentations and writings that I've done is both complex because it can they can potentially have a lot of moving parts, but they're really kind of straightforward. And I was thinking about them uh, just before this presentation and what came to mind is the idea of a Build-A-Bear because you are taking, you have the potential to take lots of ways in which to train staff, help them, support them, maintain their knowledge, and keep using it in a professional space. But at the core, it is, sillily enough, uh, all about heart. It's all about that attitude that I talked about at the beginning. And that's endearingly what I discovered the Build-A-Bear process works on is you start with the heart and then you build out a bear that's right for you. You can bring that same approach to your training for staff in all of this. Now anyone who's ever done any training or really any program development uh, this should look fairly straightforward this little cycle. It's and very familiar it's how you can discern what you need, implement it, and then upkeep and update it, and then determine if it's been working and also what you need for the next go around. Assessment, instruction or programming, and then maintenance, and then keep repeating that cycle over and over again. And that is really the core of any good training program. So we're gonna first look at assessment, then we're gonna look at instruction. 
and then we're going to look briefly at maintenance and inside of maintenance I'm also going to include keeping up, keeping up on trends, keeping up on new tech, keeping up on what's out there. So assessment. We are librarians, we are library staff, we have been working in libraries for many years. Assessment and um, outcomes measurements are a fairly intrinsic part of what we do. And this is the first time I'll use the phrase, if it's fixed, don't break it. In other words, use what you already have. If you're already doing staff surveys or self-evaluations, if you already have tech questions in annual reviews, then keep using those tools to find out both what skills your staff have already and what they need because they're going to be the best best understanders of their own skill sets and some, for some extent of it, what they don't know. And by continuing to ask them in lots of different ways, you can find out what they need to have to feel prepared to deal with all of these devices. Same thing with your users. If you're already doing user surveys, just include questions about technology, include questions about what they have, what they don't have, what, they, what neat thing they heard about on the news last night. Um, some other ways that may not have occurred to you yet is gadget counting. We do people counting, we do book counting, we do materials counting. Do gadget counting. Sit in a building and just very unobtrusively watch. See what devices people are pulling out of their pockets, what they're pulling out of their bags. You don't have to go staring at them because it's usually pretty obvious. You can tell an iDevice, an Apple device, from five feet away. You can tell what an Android screen looks like you can see whether or not there's a little glowy apple or a solid piece of metal as the back of a laptop. It's, you, you don't have to get in people's faces to see what devices they've got. You just have to pay attention. You have to spend a little bit of time walking around, seeing what devices are walking in your buildings. And for that matter, do this out if you're, particularly if you're a, um, a community library or an academic library, Walk around and see what people are using in the restaurants, in the coffee shops, in, on the street. On you know, Just pay attention to what people are using in, in your area. And that's going to tell you what people might need help with. Similarly, informal data gathering, you're getting asked reference questions. You're getting asked for help. You're getting asked for training by people, hopefully. What are they asking about? What do they say they need help with? And then you can start doing some extra staff training on those things. And then if you've got those relationships with folks, just ask them with tact what they're using. What are they using in their libraries, you know, in, in your space? What are they using at home? What are they using at work that they're confused about and might need extra help with? Just ask. Because that's going to tell you what to focus on. And one of the things, I mean, some of them are obvious. You want to be able for you want to be able for your staff to uh, be able to support library services that you're providing, like ebooks or um, databases or uh, mobile help or um, any other services, uh, audiobooks and um, downloadable media and streaming media. Now, increasingly, with things like Hoopla and Zinio, um, you want to be able to support them using those library services on their own devices. So you're going to pay attention to what people are asking for during your needs assessment. You're going to look at upcoming technology trends. What, you know, the Apple Watch has launched. What does it mean that you've got people who are now trying to look at the library's website or your email notifications or your chat help on a screen that is three inch, two and a half by two and a half inches? Those are upcoming trends that are going to be important to you. So keep on track of, keep looking at those for what to focus your training on. And then general troubleshooting skills, just how to ask good questions to help a patron get to the question they're actually asking. If this sounds like a reference interview, it is, but people don't always, staff don't always make the connection between being able to ask good leading questions in a reference interview and leading good leading questions in a technology help interview. They're the same skill set. You just have to know which kinds of questions to ask. That's the only things that's different, and that's what you can get some help with. And then, of course, soft skills, presenting public, 
public speaking, customer service, all of the things that will also help staff interact better with patrons and their technology. Uh, in my work for the library as curriculum coordinator, I've been looking at a lot of large reports from both large library organizations and uh, the federal government. These three, by the way, uh, all of these slides will be available both on the Encompass Live recording page and also uh, I will put them up on SlideShare and they'll be available via jenniferkorber.com. Uh, so don't worry about scribbling all this down. It's, I promise you it'll be available online afterwards. Um, so there have been a couple of reports lately that have come through on my desk that really talk about both how technology is having an impact on education and learning in general and how they're having an impact on libraries. And all three of these mention technology in some way from different perspectives, both generally how libraries support education, how skills need to be changed and addressing skill gaps need to be changed across every institution in the US and specifically financial literacy because now you've got mobile banking. How do people stay safe if their mobile banking information? How do people stay safe if they're shopping online? That sort of financial literacy as well. Okay, so this is all about, so far we've talked about how you figure out what you need to talk about, what you need to train your staff on, and what you need to do to keep people up to date. First of all, does anybody have any questions? Are there any any confusion at this point? Um, Anything come in? Uh, no, not yet. Anyone, if you do have any questions, please do use your um, questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Type in there, and I can grab your questions and pass them on. But nothing had come in while you're talking. Okay. Um, also, if I'm talking too fast, I realize I, I am a native New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I have lived in Boston <laughs> for 25 years. Oh, yes. I, I get a little excited, and I get very, very speedy. So if I do need to slow down, just wave a hand at me or something. Yeah, I think you're speed. doing fine, okay. Um, oh, someone just wanted to know your website. It's just uh, jennifercorber.com. Um, I'm adding it yep. to the links for the show as well. Okay. Um, we do collect all of the any URLs that are mentioned, websites, so they'll be included afterwards too. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, so that's how you would figure out what you need to train on and at what level, to what depth, and on what stuff. So what does the training actually look like? As part of my work for the uh, Library Journal article, I put out a short questionnaire to about a dozen or so folks working in libraries who I either know personally or had recommended to me for their training programs um, and asked them this question, what, is it, what does your staff training look like for modern devices, modern technology, and how do you do it? And overwhelmingly, it was a combination of in-person training, but not just formal in-person training, but also informal in-person training and online resources for continued learning and general support and maintenance. And it was frequently decentralized. It wasn't everybody comes down to a classroom, sits together in a class for an hour, two hours, half a day, a day. That stuff was part of it, but that wasn't the focus of the training program. It's kind of like what we just figured out during um, the first wave of real social media training and learning in libraries about also about a decade ago with uh, Learning 2.0 from Charlotte and Mecklenburg. It's that you need to get your hands in it. You need to get your hands on the things, whether it's learning how to use a social media site or learning how to use a piece of technology. But then you also, just doing a one hour workshop isn't as useful as something a little bit more free form, something a little bit more self-driven, self-directed, and self-important. You know, what, what makes that thing important to that person who's learning? And so uh, informal, decentralized training, in-person training, hands-on training, plus online resources, both formal and informal, seem to be the way people found worked best for the staff in their locations. So again, here's number two, repetition of this. If it's fixed, don't break it. Use what you already have. If you have very well attended formal training classes, don't force people to do 
decentralized impersonal tra uh, informal training just because I said so. Use those existing training classes and just adapt the topics to social media, adapt the topics to current technologies, adapt the topics to troubleshooting, whatever it is. Take, if you've got a well-attended training program, use it. Use it for everything it's worth because people are used to it. They've got it built into their workflow. They've got it built into their their schedules and their, their mental process. Use it for all that you can. Even if, it, even if what you do in one of those training classes is a drop-in gadget, hands-on session, or a petting zoo, then you're still using it within the framework that people already understand. So work with that. Don't change just for the sake of change. If your training program isn't as strong or you don't have one, then you can start some of these other ideas just to get people's hands on things. You can do a drop-in gadget or petting zoo session at uh, at any of your locations. You can do a bring a thing to meetings. Basically, this is all technology. This is, again, this is not technology that people are just using inside buildings. So we don't have to come to a place in our library buildings to learn about it. Ask people to bring their favorite new gadget that they got for the holidays or their birthday to a staff meeting. Ask them to bring them to management meetings. Ask them to do show and tell. We've done this for book talks. We've done this for our favorite databases. Do it for your favorite piece of technology. Bring a thing, show it off, show how you found it gets integrated into your life and how you learned about it in the first place and then be able to show people what excites you about it. That's what's gonna get people excited in staff meetings about this stuff, which leads directly into peer training. Um, the uh, Douglas County, Colorado, system um, has worked a lot on getting basically little mini geek squads of peer trainers well trained and then they can go out and train other people at other locations. If you've got a branch system, get one or two people from each branch well trained and then they can go back and keep showing their branch staff. It's People will learn, your staff will learn as well from each other as they will from a formal talking head in the front of a room. The talking heads are good, the talking heads are useful, you listen to them online, um, but you also can get a lot out of having your staff training each other because it fits that informal way of figuring this stuff out. Um, you can also have staff attend public computer classes or public technology classes either at your own library if you've got them or at other libraries. I want to give a shout out to the Akron Summit County Public Library System in Ohio because as uh, part of my job as curriculum coordinator I was going out and looking at what other libraries are doing for their public computer training. They have one of, Akron Summit County has one of the best basic computer training programs I've seen yet. It's comprehensive. There are dozens of classes at the basic, intermediate, and advanced levels. They've got it really well spelled out. Um, they've got handouts for everything. They've got online tutorials for most of it. And they're also doing things like Ravelry and um, oh, uh, travel tools on the internet. And they had one on vacuum cleaners that's coming up on July 23rd, which I would love to know more about. Um, if anybody can figure that out for me. Um, but it it's a great kind of outline of both what you might use for your own public training and also what could work for staff. And so if you're in the neighborhood of that part of Ohio, definitely send folks there because, send staff there because that, they seem to really have it together and I was very, very impressed. Uh, Another way to get a lot of good hands-on training if you don't have the ability to get the gadgets into your own libraries or into your staff meetings, people don't have these things, is go where your patrons are acquiring them. Go out to the retailers. Go to the Microsoft Store, go to the Apple Store, go to Best Buy, go to the Verizon Store, T-Mobile, Sprint. Wherever your folks are acquiring their technology, you can send staff out in little groups to go and play there. I mean, all of this technology gets sold by having people come into brick and mortar stores and play with it because of the diversity is so overwhelming. 
use that same opportunity to go and train staff on it because they're going to have that. Not only will those places have live devices that they can try out and use, but they will also have knowledgeable sales representatives who can answer their questions and give them the basic tutorials and give them the basic walkthroughs. And they'll get the same introduction to these devices that your patrons will from the people who are actually making them and selling them. So go out and visit the stores and play because getting your hands on these devices is the best is still the best way of learning how to use them regardless of what kind of technology you're talking about. Okay, so um, what was the previous slide? Okay, fine. So up till this point, everything I've talked about has been uh, about hands-on training in a uh, either the formal setting of library in-house training or increasingly more informal settings all the way down to visiting stores and playing. You can also outsource your formal training by looking at what else is out there uh, that, that might offer a similar style of training that might help your staff. So the first thing to look at is where does your city or county or regional IT staff get their, IT, get their training, particularly their help desk training? Because the kind of interactions that you have in a help desk environment troubleshooting or learning how to use a feature well or just figuring out how to turn the thing on. That's the sort of stuff that, I, that IT help desk staff get asked to help with all the time. And so, did you lose me again? Um, okay, I'm going to keep going. Uh, that your, um, your IT staff get help, can figure out where they're getting their help desk training and then you can also get training along with them for your own staff. And you can see there the connection between a help desk interaction and a reference interaction by where just the topic has changed from physics or gardening to technology. Similarly, you can talk to local companies to find out whether or not they would be willing to train your staff along with theirs in those same in those same ways. You can uh, see what they might have available for their help desk staff in IT or more generally in their IT department. Um, you can ask them if they would be willing to train your staff along with their help desk staff and then possibly that could begin the partnership that could result in them coming and doing programs for the public in technology in your in your organization, in your uh, library. Um, otherwise, you could also pay for f more formal training through companies like New Horizons and other in-person training, um, anything that you've got locally that offers that kind of tech training in an in in-person, more formal class structure. Again, particularly things like help desk training and uh, troubleshooting, but you could also, that's where you could also be picking up those presentation skills and customer service skills. Okay, so in, as I said at the beginning, um, to complement your in-person training, your hands-on training, whether it's formal or informal, um, online training is one of the best resources out there because, among other things, this is how your, your public is learning how to use their devices. Uh, they can be doing it very informally. They can be going to YouTube and finding lots and lots and lots of tutorials there on how to use whatever feature of their new device they need. There are lots of unboxing videos. If you look, search YouTube for unboxing iPhone 6 or unboxing Android, whatever it is, uh, you know, Moto Plus, blah, blah, blah. Um, the unboxing photos, are, the unboxing are fantastic because they recreate the experience of, okay, you have this new thing, you've had, got this new device, how do you take it out of the box, what's included in the box, what do you have to do once you take it out of the box and turn it on? And so you can watch an unboxing video to get that same experience that your public will have when they get their new shiny thing. Um, for slightly more formal online training, there are a few really good resources, several really good resources out there. Uh, Lynda.com is either the best kept secret or the be most well-known resource out there. 
they do a fantastic job of lo uh, offering lots and lots of videos in uh, a wide range of technological topics. Um, Gail Cengage Courses is also increasing their offerings as far as technology are concerned. And so if you've got either of these for the public, you can certainly encourage your staff to also go through these online tutorials and learn more. Um, if you're looking for more, more formal um, than that, you can go with a company like New Horizons or General Assembly, which do online webinars in everything from Word one, Microsoft Word 101 to developing apps for the Kindle or developing apps for the iPhone or um, using Photoshop or, or developing databases using PHP and MySQL. So, I mean, you've got a, a huge range of technological support available through both formal and informal. And there's one which should have made it on there, which I will now tell you about as soon as I find it. Um, Flock, F-L-O-Q-Q dot com, uh, stands out specifically for its Spanish and Portuguese language content, because that company is based in Latin America. So there, if, and this is something we haven't even, I haven't touched on, is that language training. Um, there was a great program that uh, the Boston Public Library had for its staff on 12, base, 12, 12 of the most important computer phrases in Spanish for staff. Something like that would make a fantastic supplement to any other training that you're doing. You don't have to be fluent in a language to say, you know, uh, esta computadora está broken. You know, I, <laughs> my Spanish language is limited and basic, and yet I can still conduct even ba rudimentary transactions and help people with their technological questions just by what limited Spanish I do have. And so any language skills that you can add to this mix and using all of the language skills of all of your staff and trusted members of the public can be a, a key piece to this and a key piece to interacting with well with the public in using their own technology. So uh, online training, um, uh, Duolingo or Mango Languages or any other language learning where you can get those basic interactions down uh, could be vitally important to this as well. Uh, finally, if you have these skills, if you have the technology, if you have the resources, if you have a content management system, a learning management system, or the skill set to do it without, or a wiki, or an intranet, or any of those other things, and you can create your own online training program that's precisely tailored to your own library staff's needs, by all means do so. Douglas, uh, in prepping for the library journal article, I spoke with uh, Deanne Carpenter over at the Douglas County Library System, and she explained and sent me some screenshots from of their e-media training that all of their staff went through a couple of years ago as they started offering Hoopla and OverDrive and uh, online services of many kinds, they wanted all, their st all of their staff to be able to support the library offering these services on users' own devices, and so they went ahead and uh, had all of their staff go through this very tailored online training program, and then they've uh, been updating it and are do it occasionally as a refresher since then. So if you can do this and using whatever platforms you already have, fantastic, do this. Uh, it, it's obviously a great way to explicitly give your staff the kind of training and support they need. There are also some more general library-oriented resources for both training and for technology that are just good to have in your back pocket or to have as a list of links on your library's intranet or your a staff wiki or um, part of the library's webpage, for that matter, because this is stuff that can be useful for the public as well. Uh, T is for Training is a biweekly podcast hosted by Maurice Coleman of the Harvard Harford, Harford County Library System in Maryland, 
Uh, it's been running for many, many years. It's a call-in show oriented towards training in libraries, both staff and public training. And a lot of the questions, concerns, and um, topics surrounding public and staff training. Uh, TechSoup for Libraries is a, um, is a technology-focused uh, online resource as well. Um, Idealware does both reviews and suggests um, suggest software and products for nonprofits, and they also have online tutorials and webinars that they do. Um, there are lots of, due to the events and the economic events of 2008, 9, and 10, there are actually a fair number of former librarians out in the world who have, at, the, at that time, uh, needed to leave their libraries and have gone into, uh, or they've done it since then, um, I don't know the exact circumstances surrounding Crystal and Karen's uh, movement into training, but um, that's when I know a whole bunch of folks who personally, uh, personally know a whole bunch of folks who went into independent training and consulting um, was during the economic downturn. And um, a lot of folks have gone into staff training and public training, particularly focused on technology, and they're offering online webinars, customized training, um, of all sorts. I do this. I've done this for a f several library systems, uh, both online and in person. Um, and it's uh, one. It's been another option that librarians who have decided to leave formal libraries have gone off to do. Uh, and then, on the very large national level, both ALA and Library Journal offer workshops, both online and in person. Um, on technology, changing technology, innovations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Jen, at this point, are Jen, there any questions? Uh, yes. yes, actually, yes. someone has a um, suggestion, um, and I've looked at this too. Sure. GCF Learn Free. Um, oh, yeah, I've heard of that one. Yeah, let's see here. I'm going to... Yeah, I've I've used this before. Learnfree.org is what they're as do as well, and it's um. Let's see what the comment here says. Uh, maybe helpful in some instances. The site has a section for apps and other generally labeled technology. The section starts back at the basics. Um, for example, learning to use a computer, online safety, and a bit more. So that's one page that um. Yeah, we'll add to GC GCF Learn Free. Um, and it's off a of Goodwill. That's right. It's from Goodwill. Oh. Yeah. The Goodwill, oh, Com Goodwill Community Foundation is what GCF is. Ah. Uh, oh, well, if you, okay. Yeah. I, I didn't even touch. <laughs> there are so many resources like that out there. Uh, the ARP actually has mm -hmm. a fantastic section on online safety for seniors and basic computers. Um, I, a week or two ago, I, was, I had a gent come in. Oh, he was using technology from early 2009 that was that was not the best technology when he bought it, and he was wondering why he couldn't connect to wireless systems in libraries in 2015. And I had to explain it to him in the worst terms. I said, sir, the best thing you can do with this stuff is just recycle it and buy the best tablet, the best inexpensive tablet you can get your hands on. Mm -hmm. um, so what I ended up doing was taking him up to the reference desk from my drop-in uh, Tech section, tech session, and brought him up to the reference desk, and we found a buying a computer 101 page on the AARP's website that was perfectly awesome, and the reference librarian printed it out for him, and she was actually, because she is, uh, shout out to Melissa Thoreau at the Boston Public Library, she is one of our really, really super tech savvy reference staff at the Central Library. There, mm -hmm. there are many, many savvy staff at the Boston Public Library, mm -hmm. but Melissa, in particular, teaches for me in uh, as part of our curriculum process, and I was thrilled to see that she was the person on the desk because I knew <laughs> that I could leave him in very good hands yes. um, and get that support. So there, anything about .com, um, the federal government has a few good sites, um, on, online on guard, on guard online, on guard online, .gov is another great one. That's all about safety online and... Um, that's just a if you're if one of the topics that your public is looking for is 
online safety, that's one to do. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. If there are no other questions, I'm going to blow through the last few slides, um, and then we yeah, we do have a question about creating your own in-house online modules. Um, uh -huh. For those who have created their own in-house online modules, what program or software did you use? Camtasia, something else? I uh, people use literally whatever they had their hands on. So mm -hmm. if they have, if you have Camtasia, if you have Captivate, if you have. If you have access to any of those, um, great. There are plenty of free resources online for doing screencasts and um, and screen capture. Um, way too many for me to list right now. I I bet you money if you go back through the tech uh, the tech talk archives. Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> on, sure the, we did. on the Encompass yeah. line, I am positive Michael addressed many 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 of these questions over the over the uh, the years. Um, but also, really, today's content management systems and learning management systems, so WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, Blackboard, whatever you've, Moodle, um, that's another thing that people are going to use. They're going to, like I said earlier, use what you've got. Don't, don't go investing in new systems um, just for the sake of doing it. Use whatever tools you've already been using, uh, if you have, and if not, um, try to find the one that's the simplest and most straightforward to use with the least lead time. Yeah, because the more time you have to, the more time you have to spend learning how to use the tool, that's the less amount of that's how that's less fast that you're able to get your staff the training they need. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. there are lots of videos out already. Mm -hmm. There's lots of um, free resources out there that, uh, for doing this kind of thing too. Yeah, free services. Free services are just existing free screen videos. Casting, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that you can just use someone else's that explains the same topic. Absolutely, don't. And I say oh. this, and I say and do this all. Like, don't reinvent the wheel. No. Look for uh, it. see does somebody else try and train the same thing and just watch their video. If it works, borrow it. Absolutely. Yep. Um, common craft videos. Are, oh gosh, uh, yeah. Can be, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. So uh, last few last few slides. Uh, oops. Back up. So schedule. You've all read the slide by this point. It's not that long. For instruction, you want to do large formal training at regular intervals. I do not mean weekly. I mean every other month, quarterly, semi-annually. Um, the big formal training should be a well-selected, specific thing, not the core of this, as I said earlier, unless you've already got a really strong in-person training program and you're just adding these topics. If you've already got that, great, keep running with it. If you don't, don't, don't put more work on getting people into a classroom to learn this stuff because they won't. Um, they just can't. It's, there's too much. It needs to be done too often for it to rely on getting bodies in a room. So do that informal training, everything I mentioned earlier, as often as possible and as often as needed. Um, you could have outings, monthly outings to, or you know, monthly outings to the to the local Verizon store, and that would be enough on some levels just to get people, you know, okay, what's the hot new feature on a cell phone this month? Um, and then obviously the online training is always available. So in that original s set of three, I had assessment, instruction, and maintenance. For the actual training maintenance, getting people using this stuff, the only way they're going to keep that knowledge is if they actually use it. So they, they, for additional maintenance training, it's just the continuation of your more quote-unquote formal instruction. Whatever you're doing to train them in the first place, keep doing that to give them the updates because there will always, always, always be something new to cover. So even if you did a mobile photography staff training three months ago, some new app has come out in the last three months and now you can do it again and include that new app. And that way people get a refresher, new staff get the new training, and everybody gets the update on the new app. So just keep doing it. This is that iterative training process. Um, that's what's going to work well because of just the rapidity of change in technology. The other part of maintenance is keeping up with what that change is and what's coming up. and I have done entire presentations just on this topic, so if you go to jennifercorber.com, you will find some of those, and you will find my slides. So I just gave you my, my kind of best of the best places to go get news sources on 
what's coming up, what technology is popular, how people are using it, what the impact is, all of that good stuff. Um, obviously, library news sources, ALA Tech Source, any publications or blogs or news e newsletters from library organizations, your professional journals, whatever part of the profession you're in, everybody's talking about technology at some point in their in their professional journals. So just read it and keep on top of it. Um, mainstream news sources, particularly the New York Times, Washington Post, the Huffington Post. The Atlantic Magazine and The Economist. I have to tell you, for a while, I was getting all of my tech news out of The Economist. It's not, they have a really good tech section of just little blurbs and then a quarterly uh, in depth special report, tech quarterly uh, special report with in depth reporting on a particular tech topic. And it's amazing because they're, they're writing that for the business world, they're writing this for the heads of businesses, this is the technology news they feel is important for people who are shaping the economy of the world, if you want to get grandiose about it. So they're not, I mean, they have a bias, sure, but they're definitely looking at people who are relying on this information to make money. So they're going to get, stay on top of trends and they're going to look at different aspects of technology that you're just not going to get anywhere else. So you, Find the weird places to get tech news from. Find the biased tech places, places to get tech news from because you're going to get perspectives on that technology and the use of that technology that you are quite literally going to get nowhere else. So don't, no, no, no uh, resource is too strange. You have to pay attention to it and, and keep, you know, keep your uh, wits about you about where you're getting that information, but and look for those biases, but try to get as wide a perspective as possible. Um, don't be afraid of the geek-oriented news sources. Don't be afraid, and I think you've just lost me again. Bloody hell. Can you hear me? Should I keep talking about geek news sources? No, I should not. Okay, great. It doesn't look like it from my end, but you can still hear me. Fantastic. Apologies for the sort of... I am just going to go back and point to, on the recording at least, three things that I wanted to point out. Follow along, again, the, t the tech news because it's really important, and it is actually written, some of it, for a lay audience. So go ahead and look at TechCrunch, look at Slashdot, read some of those tech news, service, tech news sources and get what you can out of it. If nothing else, you will see the, the um, you will see just the headlines and the headlines will give you ideas of what's coming up and what's, what's actually out there. Similarly, you can do things like Google I.O. or the Mac Worldwide Developers Conference, which are absolutely geared for developers in the industry, but you learn about things like who cares about new domain names. Dot photography is a new domain name that ha has come out in the last year or so. And so now, if you've got somebody who comes in and wonders why they can't get to www.bobsmith.photography because they keep adding .com to the end of it, well then now you know that that's because the dot .photography is actually the end of the domain and the end of the URL. And knowing that will help you answer that question better. So stuff like this, I mean I didn't, I had forgotten about that particular tech trend until I looked at, was looking this up for the article. So it's, it's all important, it's all out there, and so you don't even have to understand why there are new domains or anything else about it, just know that it exists, and half of that is the point. Finally, the most important slide of this entire presentation, if you're still listening, do all of this, both the informal learning and the formal learning on library time, that will send the message that professional development and staff technology proficiency are management priorities, are library priorities, and the more important you make it to yourselves, as if you're in management, then the more important uh, it will be out to your staff. And so even those runs out to the Verizon store and Best Buy and the Microsoft store and what have you, 
let people do that on library time, not their lunch hours, but on actual library time, because that sends an important message about how important this tech training is. So again, just some general resources, and again, don't, don't scribble these down. I just want to show you that these things are out there. These things have been useful to me in my career as a trainer and as a tech person, um, and I hope they're important to you as well. And then a little tiny bit of self-promotion. Um, I recently had a book published with Michael Sowers, formerly of the Nebraska Library Commission, on emerging technologies, and the entire last chapter of that is a, an expansion of the keeping up section that uh, I had in this presentation. So if you do have access to that book, um, you, and it comes both in ebook format and a, and a physical format, um, the whole last section, in addition to just being all about emerging technologies and modeling ways for, for you to look at them, the last section is all about um, keeping up. And then finally, the Library Journal article that started all of this is available online for you to read if you don't actually subscribe to Library Journal. And so once again, there's no right way. Base your trainings on staff skills, patron needs, and the resources that are available, and build a program that works for you and your library and your staff. And thank you very much. And as Krista is messaging to me elsewhere, Technology, we love it and we hate it, and we love it and we hate it some more, and then we keep loving it and we keep hating it. Uh, thank you very much for coming today, and for reals, this is the end of the presentation. Uh, if Krista comes back in the next moment or two, she'll have some final words to say, but otherwise, check us back out either on jennifercorber.com or on uh, the Library Commission's website. Thank you much, and cheers. Okay, that will wrap it up for this week's edition of Encompass Live. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you everyone for attending. We did have some te technical difficulties with our audio throughout the show, but I did some editing after the fact, and I believe I've brought it all together into one comprehensive uh, show beginning to end. It should all make sense to you. Uh, so as I said, thank you for attending. I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is uh, integrate those desktop skills with online classes. Uh, Laura Johnson, our continuing education coordinator here at the Library Commission, is going to tell you all about the new Skillsoft classes that are available now free to public library staff. So please just sign up for that on our website or any of our other future shows that you see on our list there. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live.